Hello everybody, welcome back to another episode of Decoding the Unknown. As always, I'm your host Simon Wams on this show. One of my writers in this case, Kevin. Thank you, Kevin. Uh, has written the script for me, the disappearance, reappearance, and disappearance of Bobby Dunbar, which sounds absolutely like a title for a casual criminalist episode. I mean, I hope there's not going to be too many crimes in this one, because this is Decoding the Unknown. Casual Criminalist is another podcast I do. They both have the same format, actually. If you're new here, I've never read this before. It's brand new to me. It's going to be fun. Let's jump in. We're going to explore it together. The world didn't used to be such a scary place. Kids would run around and play unsupervised for hours, and nobody thought anything of it. Raising a child was often thought of as a job for the community, so you could trust that nothing bad would happen to your child if they left your house for several hours. Kevin, that's not true. I just made a f***ing casual criminal about Myra Hindley or whatever her name was. And that isn't some nightmare fuel, and it was in like the 70s or 80s or something. And it's like, no, <laughs> no, children used to go missing as well. We just didn't know so much about it. Those born decades before me remember when all adults were trusted figures who had all the authority to take part in your parenting. We, this is, again, I feel like this is just a whitewashing of history because it's like, yeah, you heard of that Catholic church shit? That's not just recently, is it? <laughs> who also all had the authority to take part in your parenting if a kid came home crying because old man Johnson at the candy store had hit him for misbehaving, you could rest assured that his parents would hit him again because obviously he deserved it. Ah, the good old days. Fortunately, I didn't have to enjoy that as a child, but I still took part in something that kids these days don't seem to do. Playing outdoors. <laughs> yes, those kids are never... I, I heard this great phrase the other day. Like, you know, I like it when these new phrases enter. I mean, not when they're shits, but when they're nice. <laughs> Some people say, to go, you got to touch grass, man. <laughs> Which means, like, get off your phone and go the f*** outside. And I'm like, yeah, kids are not... My kids are never touching grass. They're just going to be on their phones all the time. Like, they already... Like... You got my, my kids got a little iPad that you know they watch like cartoons on and like use in the car and we try not to let them use it too much but it's like already they know how to work this shit. it's crazy they're not even three and they're like using that iPad like bum ba da bum bum is that okay all the kids in my neighborhood would play together in the street obviously a street that didn't see heavy traffic and we could all be out there for hours anywhere in the neighborhood without any parents checking out to see what was going on see now to me i used to see like when i was a kid i'd watch movies like this or see tv shows and you know hollywood they're usually american and the kids are like playing in the street and all of this stuff and their their friends live nearby i remember watching Ma it was malcolm in the middle i loved that show as a kid and they'd always be like hanging out and playing and I'll be like, I just lived in the middle of nowhere. And none of my friends lived nearby. And the street was busy. Like, if you went out in the street, you'd get run over. <laughs> and I was always like, man, those American kids always playing in the street. They have the basketballs in. They're like, bah, and they're just like playing. I was like, this just wasn't my reality. A little bit jealous of that, Kevin. <laughs> Thanks to both the internet and parents becoming more protective, I can count on one hand the number of times I've had to slow down on a side street so some kids could pull their street hockey game or whatever else off to the curb. Don't get me wrong, obviously internet's a pretty cool place and I'm not in favor of children being beaten by random strangers unless they really piss me off. My point is that kids just disappearing for hours with little to no adult supervision didn't used to be a strange thing. That's probably because the world wasn't actually a less scary place, we just weren't also acutely aware of how f***ing scary it is. Yes, this is my point. It's like, we whitewash it and be like, oh, it's so nice. And it's like, no, 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 it was horrible. We just weren't aware of it so much because we didn't have the internet and a 24-hour news cycle more more accurately. For example, we know of 32 serial killers in the United States through the entire 19th century, but we know of 37 that were active in the year 1980, a single year, and another 145 that were active through the rest of the 1980s. And it's like, the there weren't less serial killers. We were just more shit at catching them. And in the future, like when we're all like, you know, pre-cog crime or whatever, and Tom Cruise is out there on a big like hover thing, catching us all, it'd be like, no, it's thousands of them. <laughs> There were more people in the 1980s than in the 1800s, so statistically, there would be more serial killers. But not that many more. We just don't know how many serial killers there really were back then because we weren't as good at identifying it. I'm sure parents in the olden days would have been much more protective of their children if they realized how dangerous the world actually was for them. But how can you address a problem that you don't even know exists? Even worse, how do you fix a problem that you don't find out existed until over 90 years after it was too late? I guess that's the end of the intro. That's a that's a nice hook. 
Robert Clarence Dunbar was born on May the 23rd, 1908, parents Percy and Leslie Dunbar. He was the first child, though his little brother Alonzo would be born shortly thereafter. The family lived in Opelousas, maybe Opelousas, Louisiana, a small town of only a few thousand people where everybody largely knew everybody else. Sounds horrible. Yeah. Statistically, I don't think this show is large enough to have someone from this town. So that's really unlikely. Oh, unless this is 1908, unless 100 years later it's like Las Vegas or something. And it's like, okay. Or it could have just disappeared. Who knows? Who cares? Not me. The Dunbars were well off, so that when the family wanted to take a trip to avoid the summer heat in August 1912, what better place for an affluent family to travel to than alligator infested swamp? Yes, indeed. Often when I think about going on holiday with my family, I'm like, where should we go? Should we go, uh, swamp? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Alligator one? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Jeff, that sounds good perfect opportunity to touch some grass unless there's alligators in it. A total party of 11 ended up to Swayze Lake, including the four Dunbars and some family and friends. On August the 23rd, Bobby's father had to leave the family cabin for work. Being only four years old, Bobby threw a tantrum and broke the strap on his straw hat. But being only four years old, Bobby also had the attention span of a goldfish and quickly decided he wanted to go fishing with family friend Paul Mizer. It wasn't uncommon for Paul to take bobby fishing or horseback riding, so off they went to the lake along with all of the other children. So far, this is reads like a casual criminalist game. Have you missed late? Because it says in the title, Decoding the Unknown. So I assume at some point this is going to get mysterious and stuff, rather than just be like, I oh, know a kid was murdered and he was fed to the alligators. At least I hope not, because I haven't braced myself mentally for that this morning, Kevin. Whenever I do casual criminalist, it's like, all right. All right, let's go. Arr, with decoding the unknown, I'm more like, let's have some fun. Everybody played in the lake and fished, and they all had a grand old time until it was time to return for lunch. As they prepared to walk back, Paul put Bobby's little brother Alonso on his shoulders. He then told Bobby, get out of the way, Heavy, or I'll run you over. Heavy being Paul's definitely not psychologically damaging nickname for Bobby. <laughs> so I guess Bobby's got a little extra weight on him <laughs> back in the day. That's okay. Oh, that's definitely not going to cause issues. <laughs> Bobby replied, You can't do it. You ain't no bigger than me. Those would be reported as his final words. It's unclear exactly how many children were at the lake with Paul that afternoon, but it must have been some sort of home alone situation where a child got counted twice or something because it wasn't until the party arrived back at the cabin that Leslie saw that her son was missing. Paul and Leslie immediately went out searching for Bobby, calling out his name as they desperately tried to locate him. After checking the lake, they headed down the wagon trail behind the cabin in case Bobby had decided to go after his father, at which point they found Percy on his way home from work. He joined the search, but nothing would be found. That evening, after all of their efforts had proven futile, they contacted authorities to conduct a more professional search in a manner of speaking. The main theory was that Bobby must have fallen in the water and drowned, so the first course of action was to dynamite the lake. <laughs> okay. It's like there could be a kid missing and his body could be in the lake. Blow it up! <laughs> Apparently when alligators kill something that is too big to eat in one sitting, they drag it into the water and pin it under a log or a rock to keep it safe and hidden. The purpose of the dynamite is to potentially dislodge the body if it were trapped in such a fashion so that it would float to the surface. They also dragged the bottom of the lake, a much more sensible option. I don't know, like back in the day, seems like that seems like a pretty good option for like i mean it's not like he's gonna be alive he's on he's underwater in the bottom of a lake so and maybe we'll kill some alligators at the same time so is it a win-win alligators aren't endangered are they or any like that this is florida they're famous for alligators i'm sure some being blown up is gonna be fine probably good in both cases, nothing turns up. After both dragging and dynamiting the lake, they also thought that maybe they should send some divers down, but to no avail. As an experiment, the searchers put a straw hat with a broken strap onto the lake to see how long it would float on its own. The answer was, a long ass time, and since Bobby's hat had yet to be found, it became clear that the lake had not become his final resting place. By the next day, the search party was 500 strong. Alligators were caught and dissected to see if Bobby was in any of their stomachs but there was no trace of the boy. His hat was eventually found a good distance away from the lake, indicating that he had certainly not fallen into the water and drowned. The family returned home, though Paul stayed for three more days to continue searching. 
There are some who suggest Paul, as the last adult seen with Bobby, was somehow responsible and was using that extra time to dispose of the body. Honestly, this seems extremely unlikely, as Bobby was traveling with a group of boys, not alone with Paul, and none of them saw anything. Yeah, we just slipped away from the group and no one noticed. It's far more reasonable to suspect that his insistence to keep searching was due to the extreme guilt that he likely felt over having lost track of the boy resulting in his disappearance, rather than him trying to surreptitiously dispose of a body behind the backs of a massive search party. Yeah, people who say that are f***ing stretching. It's way more likely that he just feels guilty. Eventually, the consensus seemed to be that Bobby wandered off from the group and was abducted. He was not wearing shoes, and a set of bare footprints was found leading from the swamp to the railroad. There were also reports of a strange man lurking in the area, but there doesn't seem to be any description of him, so chances are nobody thought enough of it to take a good look at the man. The search would continue for the next eight months to no avail. It was a major national news story, aided by the fact that the Dunbars were offering a cash reward. Not only had the family put up $1,000 of their own money, which is a lot of money in today's money. But the people of Opelousas pulled together another $5,000 to add to the reward. That's over $185,000 in today's money, and it was being offered for the return of Bobby alive with no questions asked. There are definitely going to be questions asked. Like, no, 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 we won't ask any questions. Just return him alive. And it's like, well, yeah, you're not going to be asking any questions, but the FBI are going to be like, what's up, dude? You're going to need to come with us. The official description of body being distributed read, Age 4 years and 4 months, full size for age, stout but not fat, large round blue eyes, light hair, and very fair skin with rosy cheeks. Left foot had been burned when a baby and shows a scar on the big toe, which is somewhat smaller than the big toe on the right foot. Wore blue rompers and a straw hat without shoes. Needless to say, what followed the offer of the reward was countless tips leading nowhere from people desperate to claim the reward money and possibly from people wanting to help a grieving family. But that's just speculation. After months had passed with no results, the Dunbars returned the money to the rest of the town, having given up hope. It was then that they received the message that would change their lives forever. The reappearance of Bobby Dunbar. No way. Eight months later? Is it, what's that? Don't they say like first 24 hours are like critical and then it's like after that it's like the chances of someone being found alive are just like really small? eight months. In April of 1913, the Dunbars were contacted that a child authorities believed was their son had been spotted in the small town of Hub, Mississippi. The boy was seen accompanying a man by the name of William Campbell Walters, a traveling handyman, seller, and piano repairman. William had been confronted, and he gave inconsistent answers as to who the boy traveling with him was. Unfortunately, that wasn't enough to act on. What do you mean, act on? <laughs> Arrest him! It, and also, well, to be fair, if he was guilty, I feel like his answers would be consistent because he's probably thought this one through. Once he was on everybody's radar, William was seen whipping the boy, which was enough to, for the witnesses to make a citizen's arrest and detain him so that the boy could be investigated. Corporal punishment may have been common back then. Apparently, straight up whipping someone was still considered over the line probably for the best. After inspecting the boy and finding the burn scar on his toe, they contacted the Dunbars asking for photos of Bobby. They saw the photos and were convinced it was Bobby, but the Dunbars were skeptical. It wasn't until they received photos back that they traveled to Mississippi to see for themselves. What happened next is a matter of some debate, thanks to highly contradictory reports from newspapers. As I said, this was huge nationwide news, and it seems that some of the papers may have been embellishing events to the point that they were publishing pure fiction in the hopes of selling more papers than their competitors. I, I, <laughs> it's so typical. It's so typical. As you I know, obviously, this still goes on today. Not like publishing pure fiction. Some places do that. Um, but like embellishment and like all of this is like journalism. Journalism is not, no, not journalism. Media is uh there's so much bullshit i know it's hard to believe that an outlet would print lies to make money to push a specific agenda <laughs> no it's not but this was only about a decade removed from the golden age of yellow journalism in america and old habits die hard or maybe not at all i believe we can decode a pretty clear picture of what actually happened despite the differing reports. Just know that some of this is up for debate. When the Dunbars came to Mississippi, the boy who had refused to respond to the name of Bobby met Leslie. He was standoffish, refusing to let her give him a hug. He also showed no recognition of anyone in his family and was vaguely hostile towards his little brother Alonso. After the meeting, Leslie was unconvinced. She wasn't sure it was her child, but she wasn't sure it wasn't either. It's a double negative, so she doesn't know, she's not 100% certain, which has only been eight months, and he was four years old. I don't feel like a picture from my kids three, nearly three, I don't feel like a picture of them eight months ago would be unrecognizable. I'd be like, no, it's definitely my kid. Definitely. And then you could look, and it's like, yeah, they had a little mole there, or they had this little thing there. 
this is their hair color it's not is i mean isn't it i don't think this is her kid because you'd be sure if it was your kid you may be thinking that if it really was her son that she'd know right in her defense it had been over eight months and bobby was only four when he disappeared um kids grow quickly so he would have looked a bit different a bit different not much different it's not inconceivable that she would have trouble identifying him especially amidst all the trauma that she'd experienced in losing him it's worth noting however that one of her first comments regarding the boy was that his eyes were too small leslie asked to see the boy again the next day and this time she was able to give him a bath when she bathed him she's reported to have said thank god it's my boy the matter was settled and on april the 25th 1913 the reunited family returned to opelosis for bobby it was truly a day to remember the town threw a parade in his honor and bobby got to ride in the parade on fire truck covered in flowers i just remembered something this family's got money right this seems like a bit of a con it was a big publicized news story all of the details of the kid are available someone burned some kid's toe and is like hey you're gonna pretend to be the kid from this family and go in there and rob them or take their money somehow i think it's a bit of a con his parents grateful to have their little boy back also showered him with affection and gifts they had lost their son once and were given a second chance so they wanted to make sure he had everything he could ever want including immediately buying him a pony and a bicycle it's fair to say that his quality of life had improved dramatically from being whipped by some traveling salesman slash handyman of course this begs the question of how william wound up with him in the first place and if this even really was his life Once Leslie identified the child as a son Bobby, William was arrested for kidnapping. This was America's deep south in the early 1900s, so you best believe this was punishable by death. Oh my god. Uh, I, I, kidnapping is bad? <laughs> but death? William, not particularly wanting to die, insisted that he had not kidnapped Bobby Dunbar. The child had been traveling was instead his nephew, Bruce Anderson. Bruce was the illegitimate child of his brother and one of his brother's servants, Julia Anderson, who lived in North Carolina. The illegitimate nature of the child is likely why he was less forthcoming in identifying the boy originally, alternating between saying it was his son and his brother's son. This seems totally reasonable, and I think i'm coming around on this dude according to william julia had permitted him to take bruce into his custody to go visit family his claims would be corroborated by julia except with a twist she confirmed that she had given bruce to his uncle for two days to visit william's sister the only small issue was that this was 15 months ago so regardless of the identity of the child william had clearly kidnapped somebody julia also wanted her son back and she was invited to opelosis to see him okay <laughs> <laughs> forget what i said about him he already kidnaps children <laughs> does he deserve death no <laughs> Does he deserve prison? Yes. Despite having invited her, the citizens of Obelosis did not like Julia at all. They had just thrown this kid a parade to celebrate their town being made whole again, and some servant girl was trying to come in and ruin it for everybody. Julia was vilified in the media. She had, out of wedlock, conceived three children with two different men and lost all three of them within the span of a year. One she had to give up for adoption, another had died suddenly as an infant, something for which she was wrongly blamed, and the third had been stolen by her father's brother. She was portrayed as a naive, illiterate sex worker, and things only got worse when she met Bobby for the first time. Upon their arriving to town, Julia, already exhausted from her trip, was presented with a lineup of similar looking boys, one of which was the newly reclaimed Bobby. At first, she wasn't sure. When looking at Bobby, she asked if that one was the boy that had been found, but the Dunbar's lawyers refused to answer. If we're to believe it was possible for Leslie to be unsure after not seeing her child for eight months, it's much more probable that Paula would have a hard time immediately identifying her child after twice that long however bobby also responded to paula in the same way as he had initially responded to leslie yeah eight months on four years doesn't seem so long 16 months does sound still i'm not so sure i think you should be able, you would be able to recognize your kid no however bobby also responded to paula in the same way he had initially responded to leslie there are a couple of reasons this could be the constant dramatic changes to his life could have been too much to process well neither woman would have changed as dramatically in the previous months as he had he could have genuinely had trouble identifying which of them if either was his mother after being alone and on the road with william for so long yeah he's only four like that's gonna you know that's gonna be hard it's a lot that's like half your life basically maybe he was just a jerk and he acted that way to everyone or maybe he really was bruce but after growing up as the child of a poor servant and a traveling repairman who whipped him the little devil on his shoulder kept telling him keep your damn mouth shut and there's a second pony in it for you yeah he's a kid 
it's not a devil on his shoulder it's a kid and he's like well, would i rather have the bike and the pony or would i rather do the other you know go back to being whipped <laughs> as i know this woman's definitely my mom and i love her <laughs> Where's my pony? Despite the fact that Leslie had been unable to identify the boy on her first attempt, the papers completely dragged Julia through the mud for the same thing. The New Orleans item reported she had not seen her son since February 1912. She had forgotten him. Animals don't forget, but this big, coarse country woman, several times a mother, she forgot. She cared little for her young. Children were only regrettable incidents in her life. She hopes her son isn't dead, just as she hopes that the cotton crop will be good this year. Of true mother love, she has none. <laughs> Savage. Yeah, it's, it's just bullshit news reporting. What information? I hate it. The next day, Julia again saw Bobby, and this time she was able to undress him. Once she did, she became certain it was her child. I know the parents bathed their children and changed diapers and stuff, and it had been a long time since seeing him, especially for Julia, but it feels weird that neither mother could identify him with his clothes on. That's no indication that he had any identifying birthmarks that would have been otherwise hidden, so I don't know what it was that was changing their minds. I don't know. Like my kid, the older kid, has like uh, one little freckle. Just like on her whole body, she just has this one little one on her back. And I'll be like, if I saw that and I was already a bit sure, I'll be like, yeah, no, I remember that. That's really specific. I don't know. I feel this is okay. Anyway, with both women now claiming that the child was theirs, it was up for the courts to decide, well, why don't we just chop the baby in half? <laughs> King Solomon. Thanks to a mole on his neck and the scar on his toe, the arbitrator ruled that the child was indeed Bobby Dunbar. Julia wanted to keep fighting for the child, as she truly believed it was her son who should be returned to her, but she had no money for lengthy court proceedings, and thus she left, finding a new home in Mississippi. And that just leaves the matter of William Walters. Regardless of which child it was, he had still kidnapped somebody. The fact that it was Bobby Dunbar made it worse. After a two-week trial, he was found guilty. Luckily for him, the court chose to be merciful and only sentenced him to life in prison rather than death. <laughs> Sweet mercy. He would serve two years of his sentence, but he was able to get his conviction thrown out on appeal so that he could get a new trial. However, by this point, nobody cared, and they decided that giving a new trial was going to be too expensive and was more effort than it was worth. In the words of Simon Whistler, where's your yeehaw now? <laughs> This is okay. William was released from prison and spent the rest of his life in relative obscurity, proclaiming his innocence until the day that he died. He did seem to kidnap somebody, though, didn't he? <laughs> For the rest of his life, Bobby was unwavering in his conviction that he was a Dunbar, though others weren't as positive. However, no one really pressed the issue because the story had a happy ending for everyone except that impoverished servant girl with those loose morals. Oh my god, the newspapers of the day. When Bobby was 18, reporters came to interview him. The Lindbergh baby had disappeared, so they wanted to interview the nation's previous famous missing child. Upon being questioned, Bobby offered up some information that had previously never been heard before. <laughs> He's just like, I really wanted that pony. Yeah, I burned my toe as well to make it so I could get the pony. That's, I don't know what happens, but let's carry on. Though he made no mention of remembering the trip to the lake he would have taken with his family, he did remember traveling with William. However, the two of them allegedly weren't traveling alone. He recalled that there'd been another young boy traveling with them who fell off a wagon and died. This was a shocking new development, and reporters were quick to produce their speculation that would later be regarded as fact. The belief was that William had kidnapped both boys and that Bruce was the one who died. This instantly became a part of the official narrative, though it seems more than a little suspect. Bobby had never mentioned another boy previously, and he was now recalling events at 18 that took place when he was only four. Yeah, this is like, I'm pretty skeptical of this stuff. Obviously, a four-year-old sees another kid their age die right in front of them. They're going to remember that, but it's odd that this somehow never came up. There's so much this is so like wonky and suspicious i don't know the newspapers you can't be reporting it as fact i mean you can because it was back in the day and apparently no one gave a shit. you think that it had been questioned when william was on trial and that this was have somehow been an indication or hint that there was another person with them right i'm not saying that it definitely didn't happen just that i'm skeptical it could be a false memory that was somehow suggested to him or it could have been a lie that he told himself to justify the seemingly stranger circumstances of his early life. Given that the nation was now gripped in the drama of another missing child, perhaps it was a total fabrication designed to provide people who thought he was really Bruce Anderson with a sense of closure for his story with the intent of creating a more helpful atmosphere around the Lindbergh case. Maybe it really was true. Or like I suggested when he was a kid, 
Maybe he really was just a jerk. Maybe he just wanted that pony and now he's an adult and he's like, okay, I thought it through. This is what we're going to say. Don't know. Don't know. I'm pretty skeptical. But people back then weren't as bitterly cynical as I am, so oh, whether these additional details were the truth or not, they became the truth. At least for everybody except the Andersons. The Andersons remained convinced that the Dunbars had kidnapped their family member. Bobby went on to get married, have four children, living a relatively normal life as a salesman. The story of the kidnapping was a bit of family legends and one that he and his wife loved to tell their kids and grandkids. That's a pretty intense family story, isn't it? When Bobby Dunbar Jr. was a teenager, he once asked his father how he knew he was really Bobby Dunbar. His father replied, I know who I am, and I know who you are, and nothing else makes a difference. Bobby Dunbar died in 1966 at the age of 57, never giving his family any indication that he questioned his identity, even for a moment. And as we haven't really mentioned the parents here, but also, like, humans are weird, and their desire to find their child alive is like to just plaster over that mental pain in their heads is like yeah like that's heavy <laughs> you just gotta be like yeah no that's my kid that's definitely my kid and you're like it's not my kid but i really want it to be so bad Of all the Dunbars, none were more obsessed with Bobby's story than his granddaughter Margaret. Are they gonna DNA test this shit? That would be cool. They can find some relatives and they can DNA test it. Please tell me they DNA test it. After Bobby passed away, she would ask her grandmother to tell the story constantly, completely enthralled with the tale of her grandfather's kidnapping. In 1999, Margaret was having a rough go of it. Her children were getting older and spent less and less time at home. Her husband had a job out of state and he was only home on weekends. Worst of all, her younger brother died in a plane crash that year. A month after the plane crash, her life would change forever. She was sitting in the den with her father when he decided to give her a present. It was a scrapbook that belonged to her great-grandmother, Leslie. In it were roughly 400 newspaper articles about Bobby Dunbar as well as photos and letters. It was meant to be an outlet for her, a distraction from her loneliness and despair so that she could entertain herself with the story that had fascinated her for her whole adult life. It turned out to be something different entirely. Margaret was expecting this project to be an adventure through the past, but it didn't take long for things to take a turn as she noticed all the contradictions in the report. One newspaper reported Bobby as seeing his brother for the first time and giving him a kiss, while another said that he scowled at Alonzo and wouldn't go near him. In another instance, a paper reported Bobby yelling mother and immediately hugging Leslie when they first reunited, while another claimed that he simply burst into tears while Leslie stated that she wasn't sure if that was her child. The newspapers of the bars, you just be making shit up. It's crazy. You can't trust anything. Despite these polar opposite accounts of events, she was sure that her grandfather was Bobby Dunbar. He had to be. Didn't he? However, there were two things Margaret would find that would make her question everything. The first was that she went on an ancestry website and found Julia Anderson. The biographical note for Julia said, Julia had a son from her first marriage named Bruce, who was kidnapped from North Carolina when he was six years old and taken to Louisiana. She tried to get him back, but the people that kidnapped him won in court and changed his name to Bobby Dunbar. I I I think this is what's going on. I think that's absolutely what's happened. I don't think this is the kid that went it missing. It's just a lot of denial and shit like that that kid is gone and this is not bobby dunbar in my opinion margaret knew the story of her grandfather's kidnapping well but she had never really considered the fate of the anderson family the family that believed the dunbars had kidnapped him from them in addition to this alternate perspective she was struck by a cartoon about her grandfather in one of the newspaper clippings it was titled 50 years from now and depicted an old man sitting in a chair reading the newspaper with a child next to him the caption read grandpa do you think we'll ever know for certain what our right name is she looked at the comic and realized that this was her life it was 86 years not 50 but otherwise she was living out this comic from the 1910s margaret didn't want to live in uncertainty so she set out to prove that her grandfather was in fact bobby dunbar in the year 2000 she did something that nobody had thought to do at any point in the last 80 years or at least what nobody had wanted to do she went to see the andersons oh i thought she was gonna say she did a dna test because she can test she can find her the living descendants of the other family oh maybe that's what she's gonna do and she can test their dna her dna against theirs and see if they are descended from the same people i mean a couple of generations back julia had two living children at the time hollis and jewel jewel had a daughter linda linda was every bit as obsessed with the story as margaret was and they decided to team up in their research the obvious problem was that one wanted to prove that bobby was bobby and the other that he was bruce this led to a lot of butting heads and a lot of concessions on linda's part to be fair they're two generations removed from it so they could team up and reasonably do this and it's going to like i mean there's only one truth 
So, and that can easily be proven by that DNA. Let's get that DNA going, come on. I want a satisfactory 100% solution to today's episode, and I think we can get there with DNA. The tension finally boiled over after Margaret was invited to share her research with the Historical Society in Columbia, Mississippi. All of her research was based on predetermined belief that her grandfather was Bobby Dunbar and was likely tainted by many of the contemporary reports of the kidnapping. At the meeting, when she described Bruce as the illegitimate child of a domestic, Julia Anderson, it was decided that enough was enough. Hollis and Jewel were in attendance, and they were appalled that Margaret would refer to their mother and brother this way. Linda had not been at the meeting and found it difficult to believe that she would have spoken the way her mother and uncle were claiming but she had so now it was time for her to learn the truth about percy and leslie dunbar Margaret discovered that she had a lot to learn about her grandfather and great-grandparents. She had already seen the biased reporting, but there were a few details she seemed to either have not been aware of or had managed to ignore. To start, the Dunbars were arguably more than just wealthy. Hollis and Jewel had wanted to travel to Opelosis to see the man that was potentially their older brother. It was 200 miles away, which would have made an expensive trip back in the day, but there was more to it than that. If they really wanted to, they would have found a way, but they were scared. As they told it, you couldn't look in a picture from Opelosis without seeing at least one building with the name Dunbar on it. Holy sh**. <laughs> when you've got buildings named after you, that's proper rich. They were powerful people, the kind of people that you would be wise not to question or wage war against. They were also the kind of people that wouldn't let anyone privately interview Bobby upon his return and refused to release pictures of their son and the child that was returned to them side by side. It was almost as if they had something to hide, like they knew damn well he wasn't really Bobby. Denial, denial. It's also worth noting that the characterization of Julia in the newspaper was outright slander. Not only was she neither a sex worker nor a literate, but reading was one of her absolute favorite things, and she read to Hollis and Jewel constantly. Margaret also learned, much to her shock, that she was not the first Dunbar to take the bold step of reaching out to the Andersons. It turns out that Bobby had done so himself on multiple occasions. He had visited Hollis and Jewel, both at work. He gave his name to Hollis during a brief conversation, but Julia had always talked about their old brother, Bruce, not Bobby, so it didn't register at all in his mind until after the conversation was over. Jewel had spoken with him for over an hour. Bobby never told her his name, so she wasn't positive until later. She did comment that he kept asking questions about her life and didn't look at anyone in the store except for her. It's known that Bobby made at least three visits to the Andersons while he was alive, and it's possible that it was more. Bobby knows. Bobby knows, and he's just shut the f up about it for this whole time. The more I read about this, the more I'm absolutely convinced that Bobby is Bruce, and Bobby knows it, and everyone knows it, and someone had their child stolen by some other Dunbar family who had buildings named after them. This is some sketchy shit right here. This is some like super villain, not super villain, but like uh, it's at least like a movie. He had always insisted that he knew who he was, but perhaps he wasn't so sure after all. And Margaret definitely wasn't sure anymore. What finally tipped her over the edge was when she got into contact with the granddaughter of William Walters' defense attorney from the kidnapping trial. For reasons unknown, she had kept the entire file from Williams's case in her closet. Margaret bought a portable scanner and immediately headed to meet the granddaughter so she could scan the roughly 400 pages of documents. It took her about a week to scan all the pages and another four months to comb through all the information and there was a mountain of evidence there were personal letters including between the governors of mississippi and louisiana there were dozens of sworn affidavits from people in mississippi testifying that not only was the boy definitely bruce anderson but they had seen him accompanying william for months before bobby's disappearance there was william's own letter to percy dunbar written almost immediately after his arrest stating in so many words you took my nephew i can't beat you in court but he's not yours and you know it if you don't tell the truth i'm going to be executed for kidnapping and and God will smite you, but good. Everybody knows it's Bruce. Give him back. I know this is we're, we're, we're too late. Everybody knows, and just these people have too much money, and they can do whatever they want, which is crazy. Damn it, man! I'm rich. This was a lot of evidence and testimony pointing to her grandfather actually being Bruce. But the final straw came in the form of a letter simply signed a Christian woman. It was a six-page letter written to William's attorney, and it outlined every common sense point but why it didn't make sense for the boy to have been Bobby. Seeing all the things she had been ignoring laid out in a single plainly written letter uh, was too much for Margaret to ignore. Did you know that every year in the United States, 28,000 babies are accidentally switched in the hospital? No f 
fucking way. No way. You cannot be serious. I... So, I was talking, like... Uh, where was it? It was like a few weekends ago. I was back in the UK, and I was, having a, I was having a chat with... I think it was my parents, maybe my sister. We're just, like, having a chat. And I was talking about my experience of our kids being born. I live in Prague, in the Czech Republic. And our kids were born here and our experience of them being born in the hospital and it was like as soon as that kid is born they're given like a a thing that ties around their arm with their name on it and then the mother is given like a matching thing that you can't remove without it working and there's a number on there and then there's a number on the bed and then there's a number that they draw onto the baby like in big letters like it'd be like i don't know 37 on the baby's chest and then they draw it with like permanent marker a 37 on the mum so that you know and it you know someone could try and swap the things or do all of this or swap the babies but there's a giant black number just written on their chest and my parents and my sister were like what (laughs) we they don't do that here and they're like that sounds really intense and i'm like yeah but you know what's more intense having someone else's fucking baby (laughs) absolutely i'm with you on that one the vast majority of these mistakes are caught before the baby leaves the hospital okay good and even when the family does take home a wrong baby it's usually caught within a couple of days cases where the babies are switched and nobody realizes are exceptionally rare at least allegedly the only numbers i can tell you about are the cases in which it was caught because if the mistake wasn't figured out then nobody would know this was thought to be so seemingly impossible that outside of movies and televisions it virtually never happened but that is not the case and we know this i've made a video about this uh dna baby ancestry sites with the rising popularity of dna ancestry sites stories come out all too frequently of someone who lived their entire life only to take a dna test and discover they were switched at birth people really can go their entire lives with neither parent ever suspecting that the child is not actually their own yeah this is one of those things it's like you do a dna test and it's like you're like oh my god this could be like this could you know this could be intense and it's like well i look you know basically the same as as my dad <laughs> and i have the exact same mouth as my mom so i was kind of always kind of like yeah no those are those are definitely my parents and then i did the dna test and i was like oh my god it was exactly what i expected <laughs> it was like okay yeah because my dad knew where he came from my mom knew where she came from and it's like boom easy done <laughs> but can you imagine if it comes back and it's like no 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 you're actually uh i don't know icelandic <laughs> we're like holy sh- what happened it was 2003 and margaret had been researching the story intensely for over four years it was finally time to get some goddamn answers the idea of a dna test had been floating around for a while but margaret wanted to wait until the entire donbar family was on board however a reporter from the associated press caught wind of the story and approached bobby jr offering to pay for the test much to margaret's surprise bobby jr agreed she was on board with or without the rest of the family but she really hadn't expected him to be however he was confident that the test would prove they were dunbars and that would be the end of it so his dna was tested against the son of alonzo who was without a question a dunbar if it wasn't obvious by the fact that the script didn't end five pages ago the dna was not a match her grandfather was in fact not bobby dunbar The Anderson family was overjoyed, but the Dunbars were not. Bobby Jr. was in the hospital when he got the results, and he was understandably shocked. He had set out to prove his father was who he believed he was all along, but instead he proved the opposite. Despite this, he said he'd make the same decision again, but he was now faced with an unfortunate task. A reporter was preparing to break the story, so he had to call his family to break the news to them, and they were pissed. They were pissed at Bobby Jr. for taking the test, but they were even more pissed at Margaret for opening this entire can of worms in the first place. And in that case, what I say to that is too bad. Boo fucking who. And I know, I know it's like this family lost a child, but the solution to that loss is not to steal someone else's fucking child. Alright? And also, these are not people, they're they're not the people who lost the child. They are long dead at this point. She had wanted to wait for the entire family to be on board, but it turns out that literally nobody in the family except for her father was remotely open to the idea. In their eyes, she was being selfish by insisting on uncovering the truth when nobody else wanted to know. There was a third family, it's your being selfish, by not allowing them to know. There was a third family involved in all of this as well. The descendants of William Walters, they were as thrilled as the Andersons with the DNA results because it meant that their father wasn't a kidnapper, except he was supposed to take Bruce to visit his sister for two days and he was gone for 15 months until he got arrested, so yeah, he kind of still was. <laughs> yeah, this was the thing. Because I was like, oh, he's not such a bad guy. And it's like, wait, wait, no, he still kidnapped somebody. But at least he only kidnapped his nephew instead of a stranger, right? 
small victories, we guess. Wrap up. So in the end, the story had a happy ending for the Andersons. All Julia had wanted her entire life was to have her son Bruce back, and even though she didn't live to see it, he was finally hers again. William was largely absolved of his crime, even though I'm personally not comfortable saying that he didn't kidnap anyone given the circumstances. That just leaves the Dunbar family. The most recent information I could find from Margaret was four years after the DNA test result, and her family had still not forgiven her. They all resented her, and to a lesser extent her father, for tearing the family apart. She went searching for answers to questions that everybody knew not to ask, and she made the mistake of finding the truth. The truth nobody wanted to hear. But what of the original Dunbars? In 1920, Leslie filed for divorce and left Percy with the children. She accused him of repeated infidelity and included an arrest report on charges of adultery in the filing. Also included in the divorce filing was an arrest record for the assault and stabbing of a man in Florida at the hands of Percy. Only shit. The stabbing took place on the 8th anniversary of the day Bobby disappeared, a day that should no longer have held significance for the family that supposedly had their child back. Given this information, it's difficult to imagine what life must have been like for the two boys growing up with only their father. Combined with his tumultuous early years, for Bobby slash Bruce to have grown up to lead a normal life is nothing short of a miracle. He was a loving husband and father to four children, and he did well enough for himself that he could provide for his family and still afford to take the occasional impromptu trip to Mississippi just to make small talk with the two people he allegedly knew were not his brother and sister before returning home to Louisiana. There are just two small details. The first is the DNA results, or lack thereof. A DNA test was taken to prove that Bobby was not actually Bobby, but it was never actually proven that he was Brucey either. Yeah, but he was. He was. Hollis had agreed to take a DNA test to be matched against Bobby Jr., but he passed away before he had the chance to do so. Considering everything we know, it seems extraordinarily unlikely that the man was neither Bobby nor Bruce, but rather the third unidentified person. It is technically possible conspiracy theorists could say that the real Bruce was the one who fell off the wagon and died, and this was some unrelated child that was traveling with William. Oh, come on, it's vanishingly unlikely. But I'd wager that the story never happened in the first place anyway. If it did, it raises a whole lot of questions about who the the boy who died falling off the wagon was. The other final detail is what the fuck happened to the real Bobby? When Bobby disappeared and then reappeared, it meant that Bruce was still missing. Nobody cared about that because Bruce's mum was portrayed as being a poor, illiterate floozy who already had lost her other two kids, so this was just par for the course for her. But now the wealthy kid is the one missing again and we have no idea what happens. This is the problem. It's like, yeah, no, that's our son. And it's like, okay, well, then the investigation to your actual son is now stopping because you found him which is intense. There's no evidence, no leads, and it's a 110-year-old cold case, so it's essentially impossible that any will develop. From all of her research, Margaret believes that Bobby wandered off, fell off a nearby bridge, and died, and then was eaten by alligators. The searchers may have cut open several alligators looking for Bobby, but they didn't kill every alligator around for miles, so it's possible that they missed one, unfortunately, despite his alleged reappearance eight months later. The true fate of Bobby at Dunbar will never be known. Yeah, which is, which is sad. This is a really sad story and a lot of desperate people and conniving and kidnapping and all of this stuff kind of unpleasant i can see why it's uh, decoding the unknown not a casual criminalist as i said at the beginning thank you kevin for writing it thank you dear listener for listening or watching if you're watching on youtube if you like this show please leave a review as a podcast or if you're watching on youtube subscribe like and i'll see you next time